I am uh, happy to welcome you to this webinar organized by the Boundary System Task Team of Goose. My name is uh, Nadia Ayoub. I am a physical oceanographer from Lagos in Toulouse, France, and I will be the moderator today. So before starting the discussion with our speakers, I would like to give you a few in words of introduction about the task team and the way the webinar will be held. So the Boundary System Task Team has been established within the Global Ocean Observing System Program. It involves members from the Ocean Observations, Physics and Climate Panel, as well as community experts. The task team is charged with providing guidance to GOOSE observing networks and GOOSE regional alliances on observing asset deployments in coastal and boundary current regions that would complement GOOSE uh, objectives. So to achieve these goals, uh, the Boundary System Task Team has launched a virtual dialogue series in an effort to promote goose activities in subtropical ocean boundary regions. With um, the main objectives is to derive knowledge of, from historically well-observed boundary current system and mature observing systems, engage um, the coastal um, community to identify knowledge gaps and inform observing system design and to discuss innovative approaches, including the potential of new technology to observe ocean boundaries. So all virtual dialogues events uh, are recorded and shared publicly on the GOOSE website. So now I briefly remind you how the sequence works. So the two speakers recorded their presentation that was made available through the GOOSE website a few weeks ago. Today, the speakers will summarize the main messages and then we will proceed to the discussion. So I will first ask questions that have been prepared by the task team. Then I will be happy to read your questions in the chat and I hope you will have many of them. The virtual dialogue series has started about one year ago and consisted of six webinars. The webinar today is the seventh and the last one. It is dedicated to the Mediterranean Sea and we have two speakers. Uh, first, Dr. Anthony Boss from the Mediterranean Institute of Oceanography in Marseille, France. And Dr. Paolo Odo from the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation in La Spezia, Italy. I would like to thank them very much for the very informative and clear presentation they provided and for the time dedicated to this webinar. So now, Anthony, it is up to you. So uh, hello everyone. So uh, I'm uh, yes, I'm Anthony Boss. I'm a, an oceanographer at the Mediterranean Institute of Oceanography, as uh, Nadia said. And um, as part of my time, uh, it's dedicated to uh, the MOOS observing system. I'm going to present it uh, today. So the MOOS uh, observing system has been established in 2010. And it's a multi-platform integrated observing uh, system that aims to monitor the long-term um, evolution of the northwestern Mediterranean Sea. So the idea behind MOOSE um, was to establish um, a set of uh, platforms and to maintain them over, over a long time. And um, to this end, we we yes, we, we use uh, several platforms. So we, we, we first use moorings to we call time series at different uh, key locations of the basins. Um, in particular, we're interested in the region, we're interested in the deep convection that happens um, in the open ocean, um, especially uh, near the Gulf of Lyon. And um, so we maintain uh, moorings offshore and we also have moorings uh, closer to the slope where we monitor um, cross shelf exchange and in particular cascading events. And then we we have other platforms like autonomous platform We deploy uh, Argo floats and gliders. So gliders are especially useful to cover, um, used to cover two sections. Uh, one that goes from France to Corsica and the other one goes from France to the Balearic Island. And those two glider lines cross um, on a regular basis. So we aim to, to have a priority of sampling during the, the winter and the spring uh, because that's when the deep convection and the spring bloom happen. And um, on top of that, we, uh, we also deploy Argo floats and maintain them. 
uh, especially during cruises. So we have two types of cruises, annual cruises, where we, uh, we maintain the moorings and we do a network of CTD casts. And um, we also sometimes deploy and recover some aqua floats. That happens every year. And then we have monthly time series at different locations um, where we visit every month and we do one profile uh, where we sample different uh, parameters. And in the end, we also have uh, two mooring sites uh, that also have links to uh, European projects. Um, and they, uh, they monitor the, the coastal circulation near uh, the south uh, coast, near Toulon, and near Villefranche-sur-Mer uh, in, in the eastern part. Yes, so now the MOOS observing system is quite well established. It's been uh, placed for more than 10 years. And um, it's gathering a large team of uh, researchers in France. Um, we already showed um, his usefulness to monitor the evolution of the deep convection, especially during the past um, 10 to 15 years. And um, yes, we have a perspective at the moment to make the, the observing system evolve into yeah, something more complete, more integrated into uh, European um, infrastructures, and um, also using a new method and uh, statistical method to ex really exploit uh, all the, the data we've collected so far. Okay, so this is my um, summary talk. Okay, now, so Paolo, if you want to present your summary. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, hi everybody, I am Paolo Otto. I'm working at CMRI, uh, which is a NATO research center here in La Spezia. I am a physical oceanographer. Before joining the center, I was mostly involved in the modeling activities. Now in the past years, I also experienced a bit the, the field activity. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, those are the outlines of the speech I prepared. Um, so basically in the model requirement a limitation, I used an approach starting from the physics. We know about the Mediterranean Sea, what are the characteristics we know about the Mediterranean Sea and the implication they have on the uh, modeling, so on the numerical representation. And I mostly mentioned the, 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 the most relevant characteristic of the Mediterranean Sea, which are the, the fact that we have uh, water mass formation and the implication uh, uh, these as on the, um, uh, vertical turbulence, so the need to have uh, appropriate vertical turbulence closure scheme in the modeling. And then we know also that is characterized by a well defined and uh, our time interval line circulation. And this implies that when you model the Mediterranean Sea, you need to uh, pay particular attention or using high order advection and diffusion, uh, diffusion scheme. We know also that the Mediterranean Sea is characterized by a very small radius of deformation with spatial and, and, and temporal variability. This implies high horizontal resolution. And the, the mesoscale that they, they derive from the, from the, from the overturning circulation, the atmospheric forcing and the Rosby radius, uh, it, it's playing an important role also in driving the overall circulation and impact the IRC fluxes. So when you model the Mediterranean Sea, you have to pay particular attention also on the instabilities and, uh, and the small scale uh, processes. And usually that uh, has quite huge impact on the computational resources. So there are limited uh, decisions need to be taken. Um, another very important aspect of the Mediterranean Sea is the uh, proper parameterization of the IRC fluxes. And one of the characteristics of the Mediterranean Sea is the complexity of the orography of the land surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. So I stated that in general, uh, the quality of the atmospheric forcing provided by the classical operational center are a bit degraded in the Mediterranean Sea compared to the, to the open ocean. Another aspect that I, I briefly discussed is the relevance to ensure a mass balance in your modeling activities. And in the mass balance, in addition to the IRC fluxes, we have the relevance of the freshwater input from the land and the exchange through the straits, in particular the Strait of Gibraltar, that is very, uh, very narrow, few kilometers, uh, highly energetic, uh, developing uh, and being characterized by a series of, uh, of processes that uh, are usually simply parameterized in the model, like uh, you may need uh, non-hydrostatic assumption, you may need coupling uh, 
uh, with waves uh, and, uh, and other aspects and require a very accurate uh, vertical resolution uh, that I seek nowadays in the operational system though the CMEMS is uh, more than 100 level, which is quite uncommon if compared with other, with other places. And I stress also the fact that the, the, the geometry of the Mediterranean Sea is quite complex and, and is still uh, 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 a very important forcing of the Mediterranean circulation. So a particular attention should be, um, should be dedicated to a proper representation of the geometry of the Mediterranean Sea. For what concerns the use of the observationary model, I, I, I divided in two major items. One is the, the operational use and the other one is the dedicated tribal use. So for the operational use, there is a large community from Copernicus or the uh, Mongoose. I think it's very well sampled in, in terms of operational needs. The Mediterranean Sea and data are easy available to the, to, to the community and they are used mostly for model validation and the data simulation for posts. For the sea trial, I provided a few examples of my past experience in the past, uh, in the past uh, five, uh, six years where we used the observation basically to improve uh, our uh, uh, model uh, implementation, uh, changing the physics depending on, on what you said, develop new data simulation scheme or validate uh, a new, uh, new hypothesis. For what concerns the uh, adequacy of the service system for the modeling community, uh, I focus more on, on, on the operational aspect, uh, not on dedicated on the dedicated C uh, trial. On the operational aspect, there, there have been recently a paper manuscript discussing about that, so I must took inspiration from that. Uh, uh, and what what come out is basically there are uh, a huge gap in the Mediterranean Sea, and they are mostly characterized by south north gradient, so the southern coast is less observed than, than the, the northern coast, but there is also an east-west uh, uh, gradient with some area more separate than, the, than other. And some variables are really poorly, poorly, poorly observed in the Mediterranean Sea, like the three-dimensional current or the, or the waves uh, and uh, other aspects. Uh, very briefly about using the model to improve the observing system, I've been very concise there and my point is not using the model but to use the modelers and my statement is that uh, in the past when uh, we had time to sit down together uh, between modelers and the observationalists to define and design new product, uh, uh, we uh, clearly had huge benefit so my suggestion is try to um, establish and maintain a continuous uh, dialogue between the, the two communities. And I think that concludes and summarizes my speech. Many thanks, Paolo. Yeah. So now, um, so we will uh, start with the questions. So um, the task team uh, have, has prepared a few questions to both of you. So I will, uh, I will, um, I will ask them uh, in person. Um, I will first start with questions to, to Anthony. And uh, by the time we are talking, feel free to, to uh, put your questions in the um, question and answer box or in the chat. So Anthony, about, um, about the users of the Moose uh, network, I would like to know who are the users of the, of the observations apart from the scientists, because you gave a lot of uh, uh, many examples of uh, scientific application and um, uh, we were wondering if there are more societal motivations uh, behind uh, the Moose uh, system and design as well. Yes. <clears throat> uh, yes, so you're right. Um, most of the the data um, are used first by scientists to to publish paper and to make uh, to research some uh, yeah some important uh, topics. But apart from that, uh, Moose is so very important for other aspects, um, especially um, where well, it's not really a use of the data, but it's a use of the network. Um, we use the the crews to train a lot of students, for instance, every year uh, during uh, our large annual cruise. We take on board about 15, 15 master students, and those students, they they are really involved in the sampling of the of the of the crews. So we 
we we do use the network and the, the crews to uh, to improve the training uh, capabilities of um, um, yeah to really train uh, oceanographers uh, during the cruise. But in terms of users, uh, the the French government is um, nowadays more and more interested in the data we've collected because they they need uh, some kind of uh, variable to assess um, the state of the, the environment um, regarding the European uh, um, like directive cadre and like the kind of frameworks to evaluate the status of the, the ecosystems. So we um, we're in contact with people from the French uh, biodiversity um, office in, in in France, and um, some of them actually also join the crews and uh, add some observations to to their um, to their data so they observe um, like mammals and seagulls during the cruise and um, yes and they're then interested also in the data we collected more on the biogeochemistry side and biological side um, and uh, finally there is also the, the operational community that's uh, Another users of the, the data we produce, I would say operational and modelers. So we have uh, uh, a good network of modelers in France that also um, work or have been working quite closely with the MOOS observations, especially during the during um, a very intense sampling phase in 2013, where there's been lots of cruises and modeling efforts, um, and the the, cru the the cruise data have been really useful for the modelers to, to initiate their models and to, to make it um, as accurate as they can during this deep convection event that was really, really well sampled. And um, yes, and the data finally, as for the more operational sites, uh, there's been some work done on the, um, um, working on reanalysis of the Mediterranean Sea where they, they have incorporated a lot of the data that have been collecting uh, by the, the MOOS network. And um, so we've been in contact also with the people working uh, on this uh, reanalysis, ocean reanalysis. Okay, so maybe a related uh, question is, um, uh, are the data provided in uh, real time or near real time to operational services? So the, yes, there is a so the real time data, for instance, gliders uh, or data during the cruise, they are sent in near real time to uh, Coriolis, and there they they are spread to uh, operational centers. Um, so this is the first step, and then we have a delayed mode version that comes uh, later. So typically six months after the cruise, we take the time to analyze the, the bottle sample for salinity, for instance, or to calibrate some sensors to clean the data. And then we push them to um, other repositories like the CNOA data center, for instance. Okay, okay so um, going back to the design of the Moose network, mm -hmm. um, we were wondering if the Moose design was uh, informed primarily by the ocean physics? Or... Yes, well, yes and no, because uh, yeah, of course the, it looks like uh, the ocean physics has driven the, the network um, design, but it's also mainly, I think, because the, the ocean physics is driving a lot of uh, what's happening um, in the biogeochemistry or in the biology in the area. Um, deep convection especially is very important for uh, for the nutrient cycle, for the carbon cycle, for the primary production. And uh, so the network yeah, has been designed. So it's, it's like a sections crossing the deep convection area, a mooring in a deep convection area, glider sections crossing the basins. So we're trying to cover the basins so the, we can capture the, the, the mean circulation. And, uh, and then we, so we, we try to, to, to resolve the physics first in order to, to be able to, to explain the other parameters. But we also sample the other parameters um, when we can, like during the cruise, we sample lot, lots of parameters. Uh, when we sample with an autonomous platform, uh, we, of course, we sample less parameters. 
but we always try to have uh, a minimum of temperature, salinity, oxygen, and chlorophyll um, in order to describe the, the physical and the biogeochemical state um, of the area. And um, yes, so it's a design driven by the physics, but it has involved uh, a lot of different people and communities to, to be able to, yeah, to also take into account other parameters. Okay, okay. So yes, that was a, a question if the needs of the users were taken into consideration when mm. to, to, to design uh, the system or it's to guide the evolution of the system. Um, so maybe if you could tell us a little bit more how you elaborate the perspective or mm. how you think about the future of the design and uh, you say somewhere that there should be a vision, uh, especially for the long-term series. So do you refer to the vision of the government or vision to the users or to the, the vision of, sorry, of the users or, or of the scientists? So, yeah. Well, I think the vision of the scientists is uh, usually quite ambitious. And um, Yes, if we ask the scientists what would they like to have uh, to observe the oceans, then they would put platforms everywhere and moorings and trying to observe everything. So and then we have to rationalize it to make it uh, acceptable for the funding we have. Um, so at the moment, we, we're we trying to keep the network as it is in terms of sampling. And what we try to add is to add more variables, for instance. So we're not, yeah, we're not uh, changing the sampling because when you look at long time series, you don't want to move the moorings or to change stations uh, every year when you go on a cruise. So we try really to, to have repetitive measurements so we can start to observe um, places as a time series. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and then, uh, yeah, of course it needs to, well, it, it needs, needs to be, well, in France, the MOOSE network is part of a research infrastructure, ILICO. So it means that the community, so it's more, it's more for infrastructure for the coastal and seashore research, but MOOSE uh, somehow because it takes into account uh, both the coastal um, and uh, the open ocean, it's integrated to that research infrastructure. So the fact that it exists, it means that the community in France is organized uh, well enough to together into consortium of networks and then when they uh, to gain visibility to the government for instance to to be able to to secure the funding for a longer time so when we have periods of four or five years of labelization where we we are pretty sure we can have our funding and uh, and then every five years we we rewrite um, a new we ask for new labelization so we we make a summary of what we've done, what the evolutions we want, if we want to integrate new platforms, new, new moorings, new, new parameters. So we use it as a, yeah, as a, as a network to, to measure our core parameters. And then from time to time, we, we try to augment it a little bit. So to uh, implement some new parameters. And every five years, when we want to include those parameters into the, the networks officially, then we have to to go through that review process. And uh, of course, we try to make it uh, reasonable uh, because we are not going to ask for an increase of our funding of, uh, by factor 10, but we just trying to, yeah, to also keep it for you know, long-term sustain, which means that we, we also not, yeah, we try to do step by step. We're not trying to, to, to increase too much. Okay, so I guess this answers also a question that we have from uh, John Wilkin in the chat who ask if the process of choosing the sites uh, was a coordinated network design or a sequence of individual mm. choices motivated by local science questions? Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a bit of a mix. So we have, for instance, the mooring sites offshore, um, one that's located at Difamed, which is next to a Boussol uh, station, which is an optics, um, an optic boy, and the, the, the weather boy. So it's lots of things that happened already in that point. So they, to decide to put a, a mooring there was a good extension of the surface measurements. Um, 
And then if we go to the deep convection area, for instance, then we really try to place the mooring uh, with the questions of uh, where it would be best to sample deep convection. So we, we looked at satellite images, we, you know, to really uh, infer the place where we were sure that the convection would happen at that place. So the, the Lyon mooring um, in the uh, deep convection area has really been placed uh, looking at scientific questions. Mm. And then the monthly time series, we have three. Um, they are both loc all located uh, next to uh, si uh, laboratories. Like um, we have one in Difamed, uh, one in Antares, south of Toulon, and one in um, Mola uh, of uh, Perpignan, Banyuls. So these coastal sites, they are, the location also is located to regarding a mix of yeah, places that needs to be close to the center uh, and in a place that it's scientifically uh, interesting. So yeah, the design in total, is, it's a little pieces that has been um, put together and, and um, yeah, with, for different reasons. Okay, so yeah, before um, discussing about the funding and the organization, and we have questions about that also. But I, just to stay uh, a little bit more on the on the design of the network and the question to you and also to Paolo. So my question to you is: Was the design conceived also with the help of numerical simulations? But I understand that this is not necessarily the case. And at the same time, I ask a question also to Paolo, who who said in his uh, recorded presentation that the best observations are those which derive from interdisciplinary effort. And I think that was a very interesting remark. And uh, I would like uh, him, if you could comment a little bit more this um, statement, why is it so? And uh, if he has an example to provide. So, so maybe Anthony, you can just start quickly to say if you have used numerical simulations or not. not if I've used numerical simulation? To, uh, to design like, um, to design the mm -hmm. observing system like with the uh, OSSE mm -hmm. or... Yes, so uh, well, the effort of doing this in advance, I think wasn't necessarily part of the process and was started in 2010. And then we indeed, we had uh, after 2013 experiments where we had lots of data, we wanted to test uh, the network. For instance, for the cruise, the annual cruise, we have network stations and we wanted to evaluate if the network of the stations uh, were good enough to represent the, the volume of the deep water mass in the basin. So we did um, some OSSC experiments with people from uh, Metro France in Toulouse um, at that time. And nowadays, uh, there, there are some OSSC experiments to perform more on the carbon side, so the carbonate system, to see if the MOOSE sampling is enough to, to so make an evaluation of the carbon, um, the carbon uh, budget of the, or at least the carbon uh, um, inventory of the basin. Um, and especially because we changed the sampling, or we started with uh, distributed, uh, stations across the network and then now we are doing a regular section crossing the basin so we've changed a little bit our way of sampling and we want to to know if that way we change the sampling is it good or not to evaluate the carbon inventories so yes we so we use the numerical simulations in a, more with collaboration with other like other groups um, yeah right and so Paolo, so... Uh, yeah, about the interdisciplinarity, am I right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so what I had in mind when I, when I wrote that sentence is, is that the, the oceanography is uh, interdisciplinary and by nature, by itself. Uh, and while in the past we used to observe the oceans uh, in like in, in single compartment, uh, uh, even without within the physical oceanography, optics was different from acoustic. That was from from different from classical. I mean, I don't know uh, current or temperature and salinity. Uh, and clearly, the biology or biochemistry was considered apart. Uh, nowadays, in order to improve our understanding and also our modeling capabilities, 
I think we need to to, to start connecting all these uh, these different compartments because we know they are interacting uh, each other. And so the, with the with the level of maturity we reach now, I think the next step will be to start these omni comprehensive modeling. So these more more at system simulator than, uh, than OSHA modeling uh, simulator. And when you do that, uh, clearly you need the synoptic and simultaneous observation of the different aspect of the, of the ocean. So having simultaneously a biogeochemistry, the bottom, the acoustic and the classical physics would help a lot in understanding uh, what are the connection between the different compartments of the ocean. That, that was what I had in mind when I, I think when I, when I wrote that sentence. But even more, uh, if we, if we think that uh, modeling and observing the ocean are two different disciplines, uh, I, uh, I think a few slides uh, after that one, there is the example of the, of the tapas probe, uh, pro, mm. which is the Taylor ultimate. I mean, you were there with me, I think when yeah. we, yes. uh, yeah, it's been tough. I still remember <laughs> we had, um, it was difficult to start. Um, I mean, talking each other between the, the two different communities, but actually I think that, that the results of that tough and uh, difficult interaction has been a huge improvement for, for everybody, for sure for the modeling community, because then uh, the, the, the observational friends, they generated a, a product that was much more in line with what, what, what are the state variable, what is, what is modeling. So they reduced the effort uh, in the observational operator, for example, in data simulation or in converting the data and, uh, and projecting the data into observational uh, space. But then there has been also an improvement and an advantage also for the observational community, because I think that thanks to that product, they were clearly and maybe better understood what was the signal uh, that was available in the, in the sea level altimetry. So uh, uh, those are two different uh, interpretations. It's a bit of semantic or interdisciplinary. Uh, for the for the sentences, my slide, I was thinking really about connecting biogeochemistry with mm -hmm. acoustic, with optics, with the, I mean physical oceanography and, and this stuff. But I, I think also that within the physical oceanography, the the, the connecting the discipline of observing the deep discipline of modeling the the uh, uh, the ocean uh, for sure provide uh, uh, better observation, easier to use, and with much more uh, uh, information content. Yeah. Indeed, the, the example of the TAPAS initiative is very um, uh, inspiring, I think. And uh, I imagine that um, there are um, places where modelers and observers can exchange for the op in the operational community, but in the non-operational community, maybe this is less, uh, uh, less spread. Uh, so do you think that this is missing? I mean, would you be happy to have a data center that uh, um, solicitate you or um, ask you to what you think about the observing network and uh, what would you expect in terms of uh, sampling or products? Uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. So uh, where I'm working now, I'm quite lucky because in the center where I'm working, we have bought the, the, the expertise and so it's a continuous uh, interaction between the two different uh, departments. You see, with, even within the same institute, we have two different departments, the engineering department that take care about the observation and there is the... Um, uh, and then there is my department where we do more the theoretical and, and, and modeling stuff. But before joining here, I, I think that I would strongly recommend, I don't know how, I don't know how to sustain the, the initiative because it's somehow easy within a framework like Copernicus or the CMEMS to initiate and sustain some activities more difficult outside this uh, you, you framework. But uh, I, I will strongly support this kind of initiative. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that's it. I, I am strongly supportive of this kind of interaction. interaction. OK. Um, so we have several questions about the organization and the, the, the way the system is uh, funded. So I propose to ask them now, and then uh, we also have other questions about the, the, the variables that are uh, uh, sampled, the needs for the modelers. So we will keep some time also for those questions, if, you, if it's okay for you. 
So the, the main question that we have is uh, about the MOOS uh, system mm -hmm. is uh, how is it funded? Is it funded uh, as a whole or is each instrumented instrument or platform mm -hmm. funded separately? And um, is it, uh, well, it, does it rely on a um, long-term funding from the government or is mm -hmm. it, uh, do you have to renew the, the yeah. Uh, pro proposals every year or okay so so yeah i think at, at, at the very beginning so i was a bit more um, less aware of how it worked but i think at the beginning um, most of the platform were funded through moose and as the network evolved and some of the platform uh, were integrated in other research infrastructure for instance now we the deep moorings that we have they are part of uh, EMZO, uh, uh, yeah, part of EMZO RI. So in this way, the funding of the mooring goes via the EMZO infrastructure, European infrastructure. And um, the funding we get from the government, yes, it's, uh, so it's secured every five years. So it's a series of four, five years, where every five years we have to renew uh, what, we, what we are asking for. Um, it's not guaranteed that we are going to get everything we ask, but if we, because we already have 10 years of, of work, so um, they, yeah, it's, it's probably easier to maintain something that exists than to recreate something from scratch. So at the moment, if we, yeah, if we are quite serious in the way we work, the way we, 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 we do what we, we, what we planned, um, we are yes, we are quite um, quite hopeful to to renew the funding every five years. Um, so the funding basically uh, covers the cost for the crews, uh, covers the cost for the gliders, uh, covers costs for uh, chemical analysis for the carbonate system for oxygen, um, cover cost of um, the terrestrial stations, yes, the, the atmospheric deposit stations and also the rivers uh, monitorings. Um, so all these networks make a package basically and, and, and also the moorings on the slope. So yeah, so that's the, the package. And then some of the platforms like the, the deep moorings, for instance, have funding through um, other, other pipes. Or if I could also say the radar, HF radars, they also get funding via um, um, more like European infrastructure and research uh, projects. Um, so the moves is more like to, to maintain that for the cost of the, um, the, main, the, the maintenance and the maintenance of the network, um, not really to buy new equipment, for instance, but mostly to, to do the maintenance. And um, yes, and we have funding for five years uh, in, a, in one, one shot. So would you say that um, the, the, the most um, mm. organization is like a, a bottom, bottom up initiative yes. that the scientists yeah. propose and the government mm -hmm. accept or not, or a top down? Uh, well, no, I think it's really a bottom up because it was created by scientists and um, that's the scientists who brought the project to uh, the government to ask for the funding. And um, we are still in that process where we drive the network and um, French government give the, the, the money um, to perform that um, in order to maintain the time series for research. And also for, for you know, because uh, we see that there are more and more links between the French uh, biodiversity uh, office, for instance, and the Moose crews that they also, they are, listening to what well, they're, they're kind of using also the network um, to, to, to provide some indicators that they need. So they, yes, it's, but it's still a bottom-up uh, initiative, yes. Okay, and about international collaboration. So you mentioned uh, some funding through the European projects or infrastructures mm -hmm. and um, uh, we also see, and this is a question that uh, Janet um, has in the chat, that, uh, Janet Sprintle, that we see that uh, you, you, you could uh, collaborate and maybe you, you do that with the SOCIB uh, 
uh, in Spain because uh, mm. they you have gliders and they have also glider sections. So uh, there, there, there could be some, um, she said, uh, a, a closure <laughs> to, to make a budget uh, through, through the area. So yes. do you have interaction with the SOCIB or do you have interactions with uh, uh, the La Spedia Center, for example, to um, mm. extend the network or? Yeah, so the yeah the link to Soci. I mean, we yes, we, we of course we have links because we're part of the same community, especially we, we, regarding gliders. We have regularly we have meetings where the the glider community at the European level or the global level meet, and um, the design of those lines also has been made, uh, you know, to to yes to, to make uh, the best use of those two sections. Um, then if there is a coordination in practice on the field, like when to deploy gliders, when to do the experiment, um, it's a bit more complicated because yeah, every, yeah, every center is trying to, well, it's, it's, a, it's a hard work to maintain over such a long time uh, gliders. So the first gliders were deployed in 2007, uh, south of France, and we're still through this activity 15 years later, we're still, we're still active. So it, it's lots of work and um, it's lots of work to maintain. So it's it's a bit hard to to synchronize those things um, between uh, between institutions. Mm -hmm. um, but from a scientific perspective, uh, those two sections are yes, uh, they're perfectly complementary, and they measure uh, very uh, interesting things together. So I think now it's more part of the scientific community to talk together and. To, to do some joint works with the two data sets, which has already been the case in the past. So we, we published a paper in 2020 where we used the, the full data set over the Balearic, Balearic Seas and the Northwestern Mediterranean Seas and to see and look at the evolutions of the water masses and especially the intermediate water masses that we found to become, uh, that they became very warm and salty and that some deep convection, uh, uh, very rapid changes of deep convection happen after the intermediate water changed. And during the study, we, we worked with the people from SUSIB and we made a, um, a joint database to analyze the signal. So it was very interesting. And um, yes, so the coordination yeah, it happens more on the scientific level than the, the, the practical level where when we have to deploy glider, we we look at the resources we have locally to do it and um, and they do the same. So it's a bit hard to, to do it exactly um, synchronized. Okay. And um, I have now a question about more at a um, larger scale in the Mediterranean Sea. We saw in the Paolo's presentation that there are, um, that the, the, the coverage of the data is not very well balanced between the, the, the northern coast of the Mediterranean Sea and the, and the southern part. So um, is there any involvement of the northern African countries in the, um, in the modeling strategy or in the observing system design? Uh, so are, are the northern African countries involved uh, and active uh, at the Mediterranean scale, um, in, the, in the networks, in groups, or maybe all uh, for me. Yeah, for example. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I, need, uh, uh, I need to base my answer in my uh, on my experience before joining the joining the center uh, where I'm working now. Um, there were some activities in the past uh, at European level. I remember uh, we have a project called the uh, ECOP, uh, where there was a fully dedicated uh, uh, core, uh, different work packages to involve uh, the North African countries uh, in uh, modeling and observing the Mediterranean Sea. So in the past, this kind of connection has been uh, sponsored by the by EU and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure several uh, uh, North African uh, institutes are partnered within the Mongoose. And so they do provide, they do have models implemented more or less operational in their area. I mean, for sure, there is the, 
Tunisia, the Egypt, and the Morocco. So those three, I mean, uh, um, are easy for me to remember because I interacted a, a lot with them. Now, if uh, their system are still maintained and you can access the product uh, in real time, or that, that I, I don't know uh, anymore. Uh, but for example, also at the Italian level, uh, we had in the past uh, several programs sponsored by the, the government uh, to do know-how transfer to the Northern African country. And we have huge interaction with Tunisia and, and Morocco. So I think uh, there's been something in the past. I actually don't know if this is uh, still active, is still maintained uh, or not. It's more complicated uh, on the observational side uh, because for the modeling, uh, it's basically is an investment uh, of researchers, scientists, uh, and while for the observational part, there is a need of continuous funding and that I don't know where they, they, they should come from actually. Uh, if, you, if you check the uh, operationally available observation, the, the gap in the, in the African coast is quite clear, it's quite, it's quite evident. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't think it's going to be solved or fixed this issue in a short time. Okay, I see. Yeah, from the observation side, uh, if I can add a word, there has been some initiative uh, almost 10 years ago now, in, well, in 2012 and 2014, to make a cruise that resembled the Moose cruise, but in the south, uh, in Algerian Basin. So they, there has been two cruises where um, it was on French vessels and they, they were involving uh, lots of uh, participants from uh, Algeria and they, 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 they have been sampling the Algerian basins um, with the networks of about maybe 80 stations following the MOOS uh, recommendations. And um, after that, the Algerians um, yeah, should have taken well, the, the lead to organize their own crews and I'm not sure that like a lot of things happened, but yeah, it's uh, it was at least uh, yeah there was uh, something initiated at that time. So yeah, and um about Algeria um, and Morocco, I have a more scientific question, which was uh, mm -hmm. asked by a member of the task team, maybe to Paolo. It's about the Gibraltar Strait. Um, do you think it's uh, very critical to have a monitoring uh, continue? Yeah, continuous monitoring of the transport at the strait. And um, the, I mean, how is it? Is it critical for um, the quality of the forecast or the reanalysis at the basin scale or? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, a, a kind of dream if it would be possible to monitor uh, continuously the transport and the water properties uh, in the Gibraltar state. I, uh, Technically, it can be quite quite difficult. Uh, um, there could be option in, in the future, like uh, monitoring uh, acoustically. If we, in short time, manage to 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 invert the acoustic data, um, I mean, better than what, what we are doing uh, now. I think it's crucial. Uh, maybe not for the weather or the short term forecast. Uh, is not fundamental unless you are talking really exactly the area. But in general, for the Mediterranean Sea, I don't think it's going to really uh, be a game changer in the quality of the forecast of the Mediterranean Sea. But it's fundamental for the uh, long simulation, like the analysis uh, or the, the, re the reanalysis, basically. Um, and this. Uh, it's, it's a huge gap in the modeling community and the observation of, of the Mediterranean Sea. So basically, most of the time, you need to tune your model in order to have uh, the mass balance respected. But if we start uh, observing uh, with some continuity the transport of Gibraltar state, then can be that, that we unbalance uh, uh, and then we need to have also a more accurate estimate of all the remaining uh, uh, water flux in the in the Mediterranean Sea, because most of the time right now those are, those are uh, the, the, the rivers and all the water flux are, are climatology, and so somehow you can tune your model in order to uh, to have a balance. But if you start to have real data on one side, then it 
could be a little bit more tricky than to find the balance uh, on the on the other side. Uh, it could be naturally established, but I, I'm I'm not sure about that. Yes, the, the 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 short answer is yes. It would be fundamental for the reanalysis system and for climate studies for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's so relevant for the short term forecast. Okay. And about the short-term forecast and maybe at the coastal scale, you, you mentioned in your talk that the, 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 the complex orography of the surrounding land impacts the quality of the atmospheric forcing. And then um, I imagine the, the quality of the ocean, uh, which is forced by this forcing. You also mentioned some uh, inaccuracies or, uh, on, the, on the river, uh, on the runoff estimates. So my question is, uh, should the coastal observation network include sensors to estimate uh, uh, surface winds, air sea fluxes, and uh, should, uh, and more generally, should we extend the, the ocean network to terrestrial um, equipment uh, on the rivers and also on the atmospheric variables? And, and we saw that in the Moose uh, network, actually, the, there are two rivers which are monitored and some yeah uh, so, land station. Uh, okay, yeah. The, again, yes, I would say it's a kind of information uh, uh, very important uh, to to have the the atmospheric parameters close to the coast. But I would say um, I may be wrong. It's it's crucial that the atmospheric community is able to ingest uh, this quantity in the model through the data assimilation because 99% of the time, I think we, when we model the ocean, we use the data provided by atmospheric model. Uh, if we start having a, a atmospheric observation close to the coast and we want to start implementing some kind of blending or merging between, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, atmospheric model results and observation we have, uh, mm, I, I don't think this is the way to go. Uh, the point is to observe cross the coast, increase the resolution in the atmosphere, but having the uh, atmospheric community really able to ingest the data and so provide us a consistent, uh, uh, consistent field that goes from the cross to the coast to the, to the open sea. And, but I would say that also in the open sea is still an open, uh, an open issue, the IRC interaction. Uh, and having this kind of, uh, of observation is quite rare everywhere in the world, not just in the Mediterranean Sea. We have a few. Uh, we don't know exactly the physics there. Uh, we use bulk formula in, most of the, in the atmospheric or even the ocean, ocean model. They, we both use bulk formula that are simple parameterization of the physics occurring there. So having observation uh, of the, uh, the IRC fluxes and the, the physics there, some uh, microstructure in both the direction toward the bottom, not toward the, uh, the surface, I, I think it's fundamental to, to carry out some fundamental studies on that and make a significant step in our numerical representation of this process. Then clearly the cost and fatalized some problem. We, we are more confident in the open ocean than in the cost. But, but the problem I think is everywhere. It's not just in the cost. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's given me a good transition for a question uh, asked by uh, John Wilkin in the chat. So it's about this uh, downscaling, upscaling um, question. So uh, the, John is asking if uh, two-way nesting is used in the operational system or in the reanalysis. And second, if the nesting carried through the uh, entire data assimilation system, if, sorry, if the nesting is carried through the entire data assimilation system, that means that you compute innovations uh, in the child and you propagate increments uh, back to the parent domain. So uh, if by operational system, we, we mean the, the, the Copernicus kind of stuff like uh, operating 24-7, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, I think there are no two way nesting, uh, at least uh, first order approximation because in the MED, uh, basically, the different systems are uh, maintained by different institutions. This is uh, order zero answer. Then there may be some specific case. 
uh, where uh, I may be wrong, I, I don't know. If we buy operational, for example, where I'm working now, we call operational, where we provide support to the operation. So it could be even a model that runs just for, for, for a month or for, for the time of an hour operation, it's still operation. In that case, uh, we did that in the past uh, at the CMRE. I don't know if the other institutions are doing that. So we do the two-way nesting with the uh, fully assimilation system. So the assimilation is done in the in, in the nest and in the in the child, and then the innovation are propagated back in the parent model. Uh, in, in my experience, if I can share that, in this specific ex exercise, I think it's uh, it's somehow easier than in a general and classical operational oceanography because when we design the, the two-way nesting, we know exactly where we are going to collect the observation, where the observation will be available. And so the child and the parent model boundaries are defined in order to optimize the data simulation, in order to avoid difficulties when you do, when you compute the innovation or, or the connection. However, and so we manage that, uh, has been proven to be very successful and um, uh, we are able to assimilate very dense observation, otherwise impossible to assimilate in a, in a large scale, say, coarser resolution model. This is the main reason why we did that. So basically, we were we managed to assimilate full glider profile instead of super hopping or, or, or averaging or, or, or whatever. But again, I don't know if we need to translate this exercise in a standard operational system. There are some difficulties that we never we, we never considered if if observation are crossing the boundaries within the two model. Uh, I I think you may need to implement some uh, something in the in, in the cost function to 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 ensure consistencies between the two the two domain. Yeah, it could be a very long discussion. <laughs> yes, very interesting indeed. <laughs> So it's uh, five fifty-eight in my clock. So I don't. I think we should conclude now. So Paolo, would you like to add a few concluding words before? And I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, um, I have to admit, I was quite surprised. <laughs> but again, thank and uh, it's been funny. Also, I mean, try to put the sequence, what are my thoughts about uh, this stuff? Thanks. Uh, okay. nice Thanks. And Anthony? Uh, yes, well, I would like also to, <clears throat> to thank you um, a lot to, for the invitation uh, to give me the, the opportunity to speak. Um, yes, it's been, uh, it's been very interesting to, to have these discussions together. And, uh, okay. But maybe we come back to you if we have more uh, questions <laughs> or advices to ask. So yeah. thank you very much to you. Many thanks uh, to um, all the people who do the, all the people who participated and um, asked uh, questions. Uh, thanks for to Belen for helping very much with the organization. And uh, unless Belen, I forgot to say something from Argentina. Uh, I think we can uh, close the discussion now. And uh, thank you again very much, Paolo and Anthony.